Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, wherever you're doing, and welcome to another episode of Big Decisions for Anfield Index. What a difference a week makes, ladies and gents. If you think a week last Saturday, we were all down in the doldrums, weren't we, after that Boris game, and now, after a Milan masterclass, and Bournemouth brings us back on track, here we are indeed. 24 hours out, now as recording from West Ham in the Carabao Cup, which I'm not going to put in big decisions, but you will attach the importance that you attach to it. So I was interested in it, the Carabao. What does it mean to you? Are you tin pot, get knocked out, not bothered? Are you tricked to Wembley, you love it? Trophies are what we're about, that's why we have the trophy walls. Some people even nowadays, isn't it? it comes down to trophies versus top four. Is it not about pots? Is it not, some people will say, is it not about playing in the biggest competitions? But that is not the big decision we are going to put on the docket in this one, ladies and gents. So what is going to be up on the docket for this big decision? It's quite a few things. Trent comments, because he talked a bit, didn't he? He talked a bit. He talked about quite a few different things which would grab the headlines and make people debate. We'll even talk about someone who's not a Liverpool player and their comments around the, the league and certain bits. We'll talk about a player who's scoring goals. How many does he have to get, though, to make it a potential challenge? How many for clean sheets or how many clean sheets do we have to get as well? That is what we'll talk about. It'll be interesting to see. With the Carabao, it is right to talk about that because there'll be 24 hours on that. Who rests? Who completely rests? Who would you just leave at home completely? Who would you put in there? How many kids does Caroline from the canteen? Play the double pivot. We'll put that on the docky as well. We'll even talk the Nunes Jota discussion. And we will talk the best defensive duo in the league since Gary Neville brought it up on Sunday. There was plenty to discuss in this episode of Big Decisions, ladies and gents. So let's get right into it. And the only place to start at the top is the vice captain's comments. They came out. Did they on the, the Sunday, I think it was, after a great weekend? And, and people reacted in different ways to Trent's comments. I think it's really important to say that, first of all. So the big decision that you've got to make on these ones is, how do you do the Trent comments? And, and I mean this. I've seen the full mix of positive, like the winner's mentality. I've seen it. And as David Lynch said or, or on his, the pod that we did, Media Matters, doesn't really change anything, doesn't make any difference whatsoever to me. Then I've also seen a few go, that's alluding to Real Madrid and the move there. So that's the ultimate big decision. How do you view that? Because he talked about captaincy, elite mentality, all sorts of things. So let's just take some of the things that, that Trent said and we'll break them down. So the first one is about trophies. He said the most important thing is always trophies, if I am honest. I want to win trophies. I am a player who is highly motivated by trophies and winning things and being elite. So that is probably the main factor of anything. If you have a personality that is elite, who wants to win, who will do anything to win, then that is what drives me. How do you see that? I, I've seen some people go in, well, Real Madrid win everything. They win the league, they win the Champions League, a record number of times, etc. They are the team when it comes to trophies and people referencing, well, look at last season, even when probably City were better than them, they still won the Champions League at the end of the day. That is one way to interpret it. I, I understand that. I can make that argument. The other way I've seen people interpret it is that's a challenge to FSG, that. A couple of my mates said that to me as well. That's challenging to Richard Hughes, the club, whoever you want to call it, match my ambition. That's what it's about before I recommit. I want to see you match that ambition. I, I don't really know about this. To me, I, I think Trent is an elite player. It was fair to, to describe him as that. He's one of the ones we've got this world class. I would not debate that for a sec. He could even be he's just telling you about his mentality there. So that, that's the first one. We knew he was going to be a Liverpool player minimum. when people are fixated on that. That doesn't tell us anything we don't know. So I'm not going to do that. And also he said about none of my contract extensions before have played out in public, so I'm not going to start doing that now either. 
I get there's this thing about wanting to be respectful, and we've seen that story from a few, few journals about both sides, but anything he says is going to be public. And also, it's interesting that David Lynch said this on the Media Matters pod. He wasn't there, but he knows that Trent stopped in the mix zone after the game. David Lynch said he went, you know, upstairs, still doing it, his videos and bits, recordings. But Trent asked to stop in the mix zone specifically and made these comments. There's the bit of me that thinks that if you don't want it to be public, you don't want it to play out, you don't stop. You don't give this much detail at the same time. So I've been struggling with that element of don't want it to play out. And also, Trent is an intelligent guy. He knows anything he's going to say now with his contract is going to be hyped because of the situation. People are going to look at every minutiae of the detail. So the public bit, Personally, a good little part of the big decision. How do you see that? I struggle to, to buy that for those reasons specifically. And then there's the, the other bit that I want to end on. He said, I've always said I want to captain the club. That is a aim of mine and a goal of mine. But whether that happens is out of my hands. How do you see that one, ladies and gents, the captaincy element? It's funny because Liverpool's existing leader, Virgil van Dijk, and I don't want to call the captain a leader. I think he is a leader of the team, importantly. Well, we know his situation. He's also got the same amount of time left to go on a contract. He's also talked about a couple of years. So, yeah, it, it's an interesting one. I suppose the big decision is a couple of things. What did you make of that? Did you make that a situation as in, as long as they promise him that in the future, you know, you lead into that. Berger's only got a few years. That could swing it. I, it's just interesting because I saw some people take it as, does he want the captaincy now? Is it almost that situation like when Sammy Hoopier had to give it up for Steven Gerrard? And, it, you know, we got smoothed over mainly because it's how Sammy Hoopier handled it back in the day. I don't know with this one. I really don't. The bottom big decision and the second part to this I was alluding to, you will have your thoughts on this. Some will be, shut up, what are you talking about? Some will say, I don't know, some might even go for it. We'll never know when this might not be feasible, but if it is the deal breaker, Trent getting the captaincy, would you give it in? To get him to sign on that dotted line right now, would you give it in? I've seen quite a few say, no chance. You know, it's not right. He's not shown the leadership like Van Dyke, and, and I understand that. I understand of quite a few that have said from the business aspect, this is a £150 million pound player. If that's what it takes to get him to sign on the line so he doesn't walk out for free, do it. I can understand that to a part as well. So trend comments, ladies and gents, there are Quite a few big decisions to make amongst there, aren't they? Yeah. Without doubt, the talking point of the week. Maybe the talking point for a while until a contract signed or news comes out to the opposite. Eh? We will have to see on that one. Speaking of comments, not even a Liverpool player. Yeah. Interesting though, isn't it? No one likes Bernardo Silva. He's a rat. We can't stand him. Just to be clear, can't stand the best. Brilliant player. I think only a fool argues anything different. But the little rat, we can't stand him. However, it's funny how we talked about us, didn't he? Still talking about us after all this time. But it was to rattle Arsenal fans, wasn't it? And saying, well, you know, there's a proper rivalry there. At least we've got trophies. Liverpool always come to win at the same time. So what did you think to all these comments? I personally think it's hilarious. I'm quite happy at the moment watching City and Arsenal implode. I mean, the whole point of the City is we're, we're still waiting for just two decisions, aren't we? We're waiting for the decision, which is apparently imminent with associated party rules, are we? To say whether, you know, that challenge to rule them illegal, which will have a massive impact on the case if City win that. So we'll have to see on that. And then 130, not 115, 130, it's important to say charges and what happens there so that's kind of funny the other side to it as well is Arsenal I mean I think we have to say as Liverpool fans this is a big decision to make who can't he stand more at the moment a little bit is it Arsenal 
or City fantasy. City, because of the way you'll see is they bought it, then what should happen to them, and the impact on history. I can understand that. Is it the Arsenal fans within? Why are these people so arrogant, like Lego head and all these, who never won a single thing in their life, yet spent absolute fortunes? It's a tough choice, this, isn't it? Who are you not liking the most? I might be wrong. I just get the feeling it could be Arsenal. And that doesn't make City good. We can't stand them. Don't get, you know, with everything they've done. But yeah, that's your big decision for this one. City or Arsenal fans, which one would you say to dislike more at the moment? Just because Bernardo's talking around us, people are bringing us into it. And maybe there's always the chance people will be looking. If these two just implode and then see how much maybe Sunday took out of them, there's a Rodri scenario, and I, I, I want to be clear on this. To see some people saying, I never like to see players injured. Don't get me wrong. I know even for the opposition, you might think differently, but I don't like to see. I want to win it sort of without any excuses that way. But City or Arsenal, which ones you like the least? You don't have to like either. Let's be clear on that for the big decision as well. Your other big decision linked to that game, Gary Neville talking absolute just generic wham on the terms of who the best, calling them without doubt, as he has used that phrase, Saliba and Gabriel, the best defensive duo in the league. Honest to God. I mean, let, let's just be clear. They are good players. No doubts about that. It's not just one good, bad. We're not 12 years old here. But two other centre-backs quite often at the back. Protection galore in front of them. A defensive style. It's made for a defensive centre-backs, isn't it? It's made for a centre-back to look good on the stats. No two ways about it at all. If anyone wants to be comparison, I always think a little bit like Dayan Lovren, and I know he was horrendous, don't get me wrong, but at Southampton, when he had the Schneider Lane, Wood Prowse, and a few others in front of him, a very defensive team. Then he comes to Liverpool. How did that go, eh? Just that, you know, Maguire even, that, that change in style completely. So I think they're they're fortunate with what's in front of them. The other things to say is they both have skills that hide each other's weaknesses. Saliba, we all know about his aerial dual situation. I think he's sitting about 60-odd percent aerial dual success. We know he gets beaten in the air. We also look at that first goal against City and, and you know, it... They're at fault between them. Probably Saliba more, so they're not perfect. But let's talk about our players. Let's talk about how good they've been this season, especially now Canate back to form. I mean, we almost don't talk about one of our demigods, but Virgil van Dijk, most interceptions with 30, most aerial jaws won 21 out of any defender in the Premier League. Not just sort of world-class, but consistent. You just... You're more shocked if he's below an eight. You're not, you know, but you're hamming up. The Premier League are Saliva and William, aren't they? And Canate. And an absolute beast this season. Unbelievable. I mean, the the bit even at the end after a, a desist and a great game. A great game against Bournemouth. Two blocks in a row. The fist pulled the Abusha. It just shows he's almost... So determined. There's something different I can see on the slot about it. Maybe it's difficult to to put your finger on completely. But, I mean, you look at his stats as well. We've already said he won 100% of his aerial jewels. Top of the Premier League, by the way, for those. Ahead of Bandai. Yeah. Clearances by four recovery. I mean, the, the stats for these pairs so far this season are the best in the Premier League. The one thing that could maybe be levelled, and this is a big decision, or anything that you think maybe why people don't, Ibu had a different form. It's all right to say that last season. You can completely say that. You can also say availability for Canate. Because you have to be honest and say last season, not a chance, not a chance does he play three games in a week. Now he's played all of them. Comes on at Ipswich, against Ipswich, sorry, at half time, doesn't he? Not look back. Been brilliant. Absolutely sensational. So there's still stuff to prove, but 
that big decision. I'm only looking one place at home for the best defensive duo. It's not going to be the first time we disagree with what Gary Neville said, but yeah, there we go. The number nine, ladies and gents, Darwin Nunes. What a performance. What an unbelievable goal on Saturday. If you have not watched that replay at least 63,000 times, are you even really, really a Liverpool fan? I mean, the ball from Canate is brilliant. The controlled header from Nunes is brilliant. The the wrong footer with his right foot passed back into the channel for him to run onto is brilliant. And the PS de resistance, the cut inside and the curl with the wrong foot on the inside of the post. It's it's an amazing goal. It's absolutely sensational. And yet for that, it's not the biggest takeaway you suspect with Arna Slot of what he's seen from Nunes. He referenced this post-match as well. The tackles, the work rate, press from the front, forced a few mistakes even from Bournemouth at times as well. Won the ball back in defensive actions for us. And also a couple of times when uh, struggling would be too strong, but he just got us up the pitch, didn't he? Just He was just running power and knocking off challenges. There was so much to like, and listen, Anfield, the new Nunes Chan can just ring round for some time, no reasons at all, it seems, but well deserved on every occasion. So couldn't have done any more, really. Does that came in now? We see now the number nine, we see the first choice ahead of Jota for you. That's the big decision. Personally, I'm not convinced. Slot is convinced either way. I mean that. Whereas there's people in the front line who are guaranteed. I don't think he is convinced, but definite. Because Jota did play a single minute against Bournemouth and people have looked into that thought, you know, because he was poor against Forest, really poor, but so were others. Not great against Milan when others were good and recovered it. It's just, you know, the ball was bouncing off him. That miss from the, the McAllister chance. So people have looked at that. But also scored on the opening day. Also got the assist against Brentford. Also a good all-round performance at Old Trafford against Manchester United. Jot the slaughter, we know when he's firing. And he is he is a streaky player. In fact, they might both just be streaky players. So in terms of big decision, who do you think is the first choice for Arna Slot now? Maybe there isn't one. Maybe it's a position where the shirt is still up for grabs. That's how I see it. You may have might have a, a different point of view. You might think, nah, he's an edge of the head or nah. New S starts in the Carabao, whatever. So see it how you want, ladies and gents. An interesting one to think that who's your number nine. I spent Carabao, didn't I? How would you deal with this? So the game tonight, what would you do? What would be your takeaway? Now, I've seen many, and I'm subscribing to this, just to be absolutely clear. Liverpool have a brilliant squad. Liverpool have enough attacking prowess without a lot of the stars and defensive ability, just to be clear as well, to beat West Ham. I think it's all about who would you give the night off to. So that's the big decision, because people will say lineup, and I get that. You'll all be picking your lineup, but who would you give the night off to? Here's who I'm giving the night off to. Three of your back four. Trent, Virgil, Canate. Stay at home. Canate, you know the injury history. Don't risk it. Trent. Managing his minutes carefully because of how special he is and what we need. Virgil, a bit older all the time. Don't like the fact we're just saying play every game. I don't believe that to be the wisest method. And by the way, thinking that leaves us short, still Gomez and Quanta, quality centre halves. Nalo can be on the bench. If you're really forced for extra defenders, Carter Pennington. So I'm more than happy with that. Robbo at key because Robbo. Didn't play, or didn't, you know, didn't start in the San Siro. He only had about 60 minutes against Forrest in that game as well. So, yeah, you'd manage him. But, again, in this one, I'd probably give Simicast the full game. It's Robbo as the backup for me, just in case. In case. So, I'm sending those three home. Don't come back. 
Speaking of the three, I'm sending out midfield, don't turn up. Mark grabs Boslai, he you needs your rest. So Boslai looked a little bit tired, I thought. This one, he was taken off on an hour, wasn't he? Curtis Jones had a very good cameo, sort it. McAllister and Granberg are now so important as that double pivot. If one of those went out, and they're not the only ones, but if one of those went out, you would be a bit concerned because Max the star, Gravenberg's maybe a little bit of recency bias, but has been brilliant this season. You just, no circumstances, don't want to see them even near this. And by the way, Endo, Morton, they're ready to go with Curtis. Trey Ioni's going to, you get the feeling of being the squad, as Slot alluded to as well. There are midfield options galore. They require a few at home. I have no problem with this. The other people I leave at home, a big decision. Salah and Diaz. They're firing. They're the top goal scorers. Salah's assist galore, even when he's not playing brilliantly. Wouldn't change them or use them, sorry, at all. And by the way, that still leaves Chiesa, Gapo, Jota, Nunes as your forward options. That's easily enough firepower to take down West Ham. And if it's not, so be it. But I would rather Diaz and Salah had a bit of that rest ready for Wolves. And if people think, oh, Diaz was rested, wasn't he, though, We're in the, the Champions League? Yes. And look how well it served him against Bournemouth. Yeah, Salah... Maybe could just uh, he always wants to play every game. It'll be about records and numbers. I understand that, but just a little bit of rest here, bigger occasions. I think is a great thing. So that is how I would do it personally. We'll have to see how slot lines up, but yeah, keep people at home. That would be my big thing. And then the interesting point I want to tackle is there's two elements to this. I'll go with the first one. Luis Diaz. I've seen a few people say this about Luis Diaz, that Sam Maguire mentioned it in one of his articles about if Luis Diaz gets 15 league goals, we could be in a title challenge. David Lynch kind of alluded to it, and it's funny, just, I don't think it was Lynch, just called out the number 15, so it's the one we've got to put on the docket for big decisions. If Luis Diaz gets 15 league goals, does that have the potential to move the needle for Liverpool to be in a title race. What's your thoughts on that? Because he got eight last season, so essentially it's just about to shy off doubling what he got. You could argue seven goals is a lot, and I know you might have to sometimes pick which game, as it were, you'd want those sevens to be transferred to, but it's another ten from what he has currently. Does that push us, points-wise, into that? That's a big question to ask, isn't it? I don't know, personally. I, I really don't. It, it's not quite Mane-esque numbers. That I know you could say it is pretty much that, that from, from what he got. But, yeah, does it really push us into a title challenge? I just don't know about that. That is a big decision to make, isn't it? On the other side, and I've seen people mention this as well. David Lynch, funny enough, wrote, it, wrote about it. People are still talking about it. Liverpool's defence, is it great? Does this push them in a title challenge? Or is it anything to worry about? How do you see Liverpool's defence? So David Lynch wrote about it for, for his sub staff. And I see quite a few people commenting almost a, a nervousness to it. As in, can they keep up these clean sheets that the chances we're conceding and, and different bits? So there's a few things that I'd reference. And, and I'm kind of stealing this phrase from... The Up Boys, because they mentioned it. They have a phrase in case anyone's missed it called garbage time. As in, when almost the game was done, essentially, Liverpool are conceding chances. Like, for instance, against United, when it's 3 0, that's when we're giving up the chances. Not that, and Slot even mentioned this in his press conference about Bournemouth, something we were, you know, we're using the keeper too much. But if the game's almost gone or we're pretty much ahead, does that play a part? I mean, if you give chances up in that garbage time, is that a true reflection of what's happening? Because when the game is in the balance, if you want to say that way, I mean, the XG against it is pretty remarkable, isn't it? Like the, the clean sheets we have, that's pretty remarkable as well at the same time. I mean, 
Look at look at the games. In the league, one goal. Clean sheet Ipswich, clean sheet Brentford, clean sheet United at Old Trafford. The one against Barrett's kills, done it. And a clean sheet. So one goal in five games is pretty good. Maybe if they'd actually switched on for the first few minutes against Milan, it would have been a one there as well. But, you know, and, and but it's interesting because that's your big decision. Is it sustainable? And as Slot alluded to, he mentioned this in the press conference, it's important to call out. It's funny how he said it's the, the left hand, the right side of the table, or we said the top or bottom of the table. If you look at how we play or who we've played so far, people might say it's been the easier fixtures. United away at Old Trafford. Yeah, that, that's one that we've not done well in in recent times. I think it's important to say. So people might look at that. People might also say, well, Ipswich away, the opening day, the first time they'll be up to the Premier League, that could have easily been a, a tough one, a, the proverbial banana skin, as it were, where you slipped up. So people will bring that one into the mix. But if you're honest, Bournemouth, Forest, Brentford at home, I think a lot of people would have been looking for nine points. I think it's fair to say that as well. So I, I get what you're saying. So I suppose that factors into what do you think? Do you think Luis Diaz, if he gets, and he said if, if he gets 15 goals, that moves a needle for a title challenge. If Liverpool keep up this defensive measliness, if that's the right phrase, does that move the needle of a title challenge? Some of you, and I understand this will be, no, we did sign six, we did sign another one of this, we haven't got enough, and I will understand that completely but those are the talking points aren't they people keep mentioning Diaz with 15 people keep talking are we defending well is it sustainable do we have to wait until we play one of the or well, some of the big teams we've got the famous line that we keep using this lost rain so far a bigger sample size but there we go ladies and gents there we go in about 24 hours, we face West Ham in the Carabao. Fascinating to see the lineup. Fascinating to see how that goes. Probably today, if it is Wednesday, 25th September, when you listen to this, you might have the news. It might be late on. Who knows? Whenever you're listening to this, however you're listening to this, though, enjoy your day, ladies and gents, or what's left of it. That was another big decisions for Anfield Index.